Healthcare is one of the most politically charged issues of our time, but it's also one of the most misunderstood. Obama's landmark healthcare legislation is a thousand pages long, and a third of Americans, it was reported earlier this year, don't know that Obamacare is the same thing as the Affordable Care Act, not to mention the huge number of factors that play into making any personal health care decision. It can be confusing. Here to discuss how data can be used to better understand health care policy and decision making is Dr. Laura Hatfield, a biostatistician at Harvard Med School. Laura, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me. All right, so what is... Uh, what does biostatistics mean? That sounds, that sounds very fancy. It is very fancy. No, it's not fancy. It's statistics applied to living things. So that's plants, animals, and in the case of my research, humans. So that uh, raises the question, what is statistics? So to me, statistics is the process of gleaning reliable uh, insights from data that help uh, us understand how the world works. And so for you, it's, it's about applying these these statistical methods to healthcare policy. You're in the Department of Healthcare Policy. That's right. And so that does that mean you help physicians make better decisions, or do you make patients make better decisions? You make everybody make better decisions? What do you how do you use how can these things be useful? Primarily my target is patients, clinicians, and policymakers. And you gotta help them figure out what can be most effective. Exactly. Isn't healthcare like an art? Isn't <laughs> isn't how do you how do you quantify like the doctor patient relationship? So I'm not interested in inserting myself between the doctor and the patient. Um, instead, I'd like to provide them with tools that they can use together to sift through what is an increasingly complex landscape of evidence. So for example, in the case of treatment A versus treatment B, um, frequently the physician has access to a ton of information on the risks and the benefits of each of those treatments. And it's her job to communicate that complicated landscape of information to her patient, help get, glean from the patient what the patient's own preferences are, mm -hmm. whether they care more about cost or side effects or longevity. Um, and I just think that that's a fairly demanding task of a physician who's busy and has a 15-minute appointment. So if I can put into the physician's hands tools that will make that process of synthesizing complicated evidence for a patient and taking the patient's own preferences as inputs into a decision that is tailored to the best evidence we have available and the patient's own values, uh, then I feel like I've done a service to them rather than imposing my will. Uh, how do, how do we know what patient's values are? So like there's risk orientations and all these sorts of things that patients maybe one day desire something or maybe desire something else another day. Or there have got to be like a zillion different personality traits you have to be concerned about. How do you, how do you measure all those things? Fortunately, psychometricians have been thinking about this for a lot longer than I have. So there are a wide variety of standardized tools that help elicit from patients or other decision makers how bad they think certain outcomes would be for them. Psychometricians are, are uh, methods of people or people who study uh, stats or... or... The, the methods for measuring um, properties about psychology. Okay. So they invent things like IQ tests, for example, and they also have worked on developing these... Uh, value elicitation methods to get health utilities out of people. So this is less about, it's less about uh, action, actual outcome and more about like figuring out what option is best for the patient. It's not necessarily that you'll live longer if you choose this or or if that's what, unless that's what they Unless want. that's what you care most about, okay. right? So if, if us, this, this comes up in cancer treatment all the time, which is where I began this work. Um, a lot of chemotherapies are, have a very heavy toxicity burden, so they cause your hair to fall out and you get really terribly nauseous, um, and they may have longer term health effects, like radiation, for example, can lead to downstream increased risks of other types of cancer. So sorting out whether you care more about that quality of life piece, the, the toxicities of the cancer treatment itself, versus the potential of maybe saving X weeks of life uh, in the cases of very serious cancer is a really personal question, right? That varies from person to person. And it also probably varies over the course of a person's life. So. Um, if you have an important family event coming up in two weeks, those two weeks might be the most important two weeks that we could give you, and you're willing to tolerate anything in exchange to make it to your daughter's wedding. If, on the other hand, you've been living with this cancer for 20 years and you're 99 years old, you might want to just prioritize palliation and symptom management. Mm -hmm. And so those two people just really would be served by a more personalized synthesis of the available evidence on the uncertain outcomes of treatment. So what are the sorts of things that you found? I mean, so through your research, uh 
What, what do you find about, do doctors uh, enjoy these tools? Is it something helpful? Are patients able to pick options that, that better suit their, their preferences? There's been a ton of uh, evidence on the effectiveness of risk prediction tools. I think they've made really great strides. The ability of a physician to plug in a bunch of quantities about a patient and get a, a better prognosis. There has been less evidence on the use of the tools to make treatment choices, and particularly in the case where you're trying to nudge a doctor to do something that the evidence suggests is low value or, or high value. Um, that has been a has shown very limited results so far. So a lot of the work that I've been involved in has tried to understand how do physicians make decisions and what factors do they incorporate and how can we nudge them in the direction of more evidence-based choices or higher value care. Um, and those have really not paid off. Um, and I think part of that has to do, and there's also evidence on this, with the, the crowded information space in which modern medicine takes place. So the visits are very short. The physician is interacting with the EHR while sim simultaneously trying to have a personal connection with the patient. Um, and the EHR, the electronic health record, is pushing a lot of information at them. And there's something called alarm fatigue. If the physician is just overburdened and tired of all these alarms popping up at her, she may just quickly click through that and ignore it. Um, so there are some human machine interface problems that I think haven't really been solved yet. So even if the machine is producing awesome information, mm -hmm. the ability to take that information in and apply it is the, the missing step here. Have you, have there been any surprising results from your, from your research? Yeah, so we've <laughs> published a lot of null studies, which is kind of fun because I think it makes us feel good about ourselves that we aren't just pee hacking our way towards sensational results. Right. But some of the things that have not worked out um, in the studies that I've been involved with were a little surprising because the ideas seem on their face so intuitive and so appealing. And price transparency is one of those. Price transparency. Right. So a lot of people think that if only I knew what the cost of the care, the medical care that I wanted was going to be in advance of going in, I could shop for health care like I shop for books or cars or shoes or anything else. Um, and so many states uh, got on board with this idea and passed these price transparency laws which said hospitals, you have to be transparent about the prices that you're charging consumers for health care so that they can use their health care dollars wisely and shop for care. And the payers, the insurance uh, companies, also got on board with this idea by giving consumers a lot more skin in the game in the form of high deductibles so that uh, patients would really be encouraged to go out and use those dollars wisely by shopping for mm -hmm. care. And this is such an incredibly uh, appealing idea right. and it has really spread kind of like wildfire. Um, and the challenges with m sort of making that idea work and reducing spending via the process of shopping based on price are so um, many fold and varied yeah. that that's been, uh, I think, surprising to people. So why would price transparency uh, matter it, the idea that if you have various options for the various options for the same operation, or is it more that you just have different costs associated with different operations? There, there are two margins that yeah. you could shop for price on the intensive and extensive. Do I get the thing or not? Yeah, which is like A, B, C uh, yeah. treatment options, and then there's. Once I've committed to a course of care, from which facility or provider uh, will I get that care? And you imagine that if you knew which one was the cheapest, you would just follow the cost. Right. So if you're getting something that is essentially a commodity, yeah. so like an x-ray or yeah. an MRI, these are sort of classic cases of things that ought to be shoppable. Yeah. Because an MRI here is an MRI here is an yeah. MRI here, right? So if we can encourage patients to shop for the cheapest MRI yeah. and go maybe down the street to the local freestanding imaging clinic mm -hmm. instead of having it down in the basement of the doctor's office or the hospital where they're being seen, um, the price difference could be huge. I mean, tens of thousands of dollars of differences mm -hmm. de depending on which procedures you're talking about. So the idea is as simple as that. Just go down the street to the cheap MRI, get your MRI, they can send the results back to your doc and you will have just saved several thousand dollars, which right. You want to do because you're paying out of your own pocket because you're still trying to meet your deductible. Right. That's the idea. Yeah. The promise has not been met for like a huge number of reasons. One. Sorry, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Oh, price raise really doesn't work. It totally doesn't work. What? <laughs> it doesn't. Nobody cares about it. Uh, so there's a bunch of reasons. One is that people just are not used to shopping for healthcare based on price. There's a huge information imbalance when your doctor says go get an MRI. You are in this emotional state oh my gosh, maybe I have a brain tumor, I need this MRI, I have to figure this out right away. And if the doctor says, you can get it downstairs, where are you going to go? 
you're going to go downstairs, go downstairs right? Yeah. Because it's convenient, because the doctor said so, yeah. because you don't know that MRIs vary in price by thousands of dollars I if you were to, that. right? You wouldn't know. Um, so even if you're not like in the moment, in this heated moment, it really doesn't occur to people that they could look up the prices of things. So when price tools are made available to people, we see use rates in the less than 5% range. So wow. fewer than 5% of people ever even bother to log on to a free tool that's made available to them by say their employer or their insurance company. But that's something that just might change over time. Like as people, it's, this, you're, not, you're not saying forever people won't care about price, but maybe just right now, maybe the process isn't quite right for them. Right. Is that right? So currently the tools that are available, people just don't use yeah. them. Uh, the other is that people are very sticky and loyal to their providers. So mm -hmm. that implies that a small fraction of overall healthcare spending is shoppable. Yeah. So we think of an MRI as pretty mm -hmm. shoppable, but your primary care physician is not a thing that most people are going to choose based on price. So we're left with this very narrow slice of healthcare spending, which is things that are, you can anticipate in advance and therefore go on and look up the price and choose based on price. Uh, so they can't be emergent things. And they have to be things where you don't feel any loyalty to your provider, so you're willing to switch based on price. Um, and moreover, they have to be things that stay under your deductible, because if you go through your deductible, now you're not price sensitive anymore, because now the insurance company is picking up right, the right, most right, of the bill. Right. Uh, and they have to be things where there is enough price variation in the service in your local area to make it worth it. Right? If I save a dollar by getting my MRI down the street, clearly that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm probably not going to be willing to travel 50 miles to get a cheaper MRI. Mm -hmm. So all those things need to be in place in order for this price transparency movement combined with high deductibles to produce any cost savings. And so far, we see essentially no action on the price transparency front. And as you say, it's early, so things could change. The culture of how we consume healthcare could evolve over time. Um, but that feels uh, a long ways off. Mm. Should we roll out the corn? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of heli decisions, um, we've got some Trader Joe's giant Peruvian Inca corn. Mm -hmm. um, well, first off, what is what is giant corn? Giant corn is corn that's bigger than other corn. Is, 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 are you sure? Because like, you know, people say, you know, baby carrots, my brother, t this morning my brother told me that baby oh. carrots are just, well, the ones you buy in the bag at the store are just big carrots that are cut into small carrots, which seems like a total scam. So are you sure these aren't just like four pieces of corn stuck together? I feel pretty certain about this, but I have not been to Peru to yeah. verify with my own eyes that the corn these, there is they, really they bigger. They look like single kernels, I'll but have to say. But they're pretty big. Uh, and that makes them somehow more delicious. I don't know, something about the surface area ratio um, makes them better. And they're salted after you. I, my, uh, my, mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they could be, I mean, they could come from these huge kernels of, mm. is that, see, so, they, is that, let me see, I'm not, oh, they're, they're so crispy. They're so crispy, right? And they're salty. They're um, great. There's a, there's a popular snack in the United States called corn nuts, mm -hmm. which are a similar concept, yeah. but a smaller corn kernel uh. and a funkier flavor profile. This I, is simpler. This is simpler. This is like a clean taste. And I'm a savory person, so I know. You're a savory person. I know that a lot of people prefer their snacks on the sweet side, cookies and things you know, like what that. What about, surely you like chocolate. It's just not that. What? It's not, it's not that I object to it. I just wouldn't. If I had a choice between chocolate and giant Peruvian in, Incan corn, corn I would choose this every oh, time. Incan corn nuts, too. How do we know what the Incan snacked on, you know? It's like, how do, we, do they have, how, what do we have data on that? Well, we do know that maize is a New World product, mm. right? So this is from the Americas. So it is sort of what we should all be eating on these continents here. <laughs> is giant corn still... Had in Peru, I guess I, do. I assume they must they must use it for. So I don't know if this is just like a massive cultural appropriation mm -hmm. on the part of Trader Joe's. <laughs> They're kind of known for that, right? Like if you buy their Mexican food, it's Trader Jose's. So gotcha. they could just be running a, a massive scam on the level of the baby carrot scam. I don't know. Branding this giant corn with Peruvian Incan, you know, there's like llamas on the bag. I, <laughs> I, have, true. I have not well, done the research actually, on this. It says, it says you no longer need a llama to hit the high trails to track down this crunchy, salty snack. As if it kind of just exists in the wild, I the guess. The ancient so, Incans I mean, rode uh -huh. their llamas up to the to the peaks of the Andes to get the giant salt, I would. salty corn nuts. Yeah, it was delicious. Exactly.
You know, I'm always on the search for a good salty snack. Now, corn also, so corn is also grown in other parts of America. It's, you know, we're closer to where we're from. Uh, corn is grown in uh, Nebraska, as other parts of the Midwest, the Great Plains. Um, and, and corn is a product that has, um, it has agricultural subsidies. And agricultural subsidies are politically controversial. Um, and another thing that's politically controversial is Donald Trump. That was a beautiful and segue. <laughs> you I thought of it all by myself. Uh, and so then Donald Trump is trying to uh, it, repeal uh, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, or redo it. He wants to repeal and replace. Sure, yeah. Um, and for people who study health care, you know, you have articles. You have articles based on data from, you know, from... Uh, from the last couple years, on a, in a, in you could wake up in a month and you'd have to redo all that research or what would happen? It totally, would totally change your world. Well, although for many people who might lose coverage under a repeal, it would be devastating and there are real welfare consequences to a repeal decision depending on what the replacement is. For researchers, every time a policy changes, that's an opportunity to understand something about how the world works. So for example, here in Massachusetts, we kind of got an early preview of Obamacare with Romney Care, basically, was a very similar uh, policy reform and we had the opportunity to study the before and after changes and see what happened in Massachusetts after the coverage expansions. Um, and Obamacare was rolled out in phases. Some of the states, so the biggest expansion in, under Obamacare was actually the Medicaid expansion. Although the exchanges, the marketplaces get a lot of play and people talk about the premiums and the subsidies on the exchanges, it's actually a very small number of people who are covered by that mechanism. The Medicaid expansion was a, a much bigger portion of people being covered. So every time a policy changes, we health policy researchers swoop in to start analyzing the data to find out what happened. Um, so a cynical view of a coming policy change would be, well, it's another opportunity to learn what happens when you take away health insurance from a whole bunch of people. Um, and I think what we'll learn will be horrifying, uh, but at least we will have the evidence base um, to support some of the policy arguments that we'd like to make. When Congress announces, you know, they've, uh, several times this year they've tried to repeal uh, and they failed just just barely, um, and some of it you imagine has to do with these congressional budget estimates and things that come out about how many people are going to lose coverage and what it kind of leads to. So, are you sort of suspicious of that almost immediacy with how they can judge a an act, or um, or is that just based on different data? Yeah, they have to base those projections on everything we know about the world up to now and some forecasting. Um, I think the CBO does amazing work and they are under intense time pressure and political pressure. Um, and the modelers there are extraordinarily experienced in modeling the effects of policy changes. But of course, they're forecasters, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll never really know uh, whether they got it right until after the thing happens and we check that against their forecasts. And frequently their forecasts are off, but I think they do an, an amazing job of forecasting. But that's different from analyzing the actual effect of a policy change. So you have to rely on data that's, you said, three or four years old. Oftentimes, yeah. What are the sorts of questions that we don't even have data on? Uh, what do you see as the gaps in the, in the So world? speaking of Obamacare, um, one of the places where we lack information is from the exchanges themselves. Because there's this funny patchwork of state facilitated and state run and managed exchanges and then federally managed and facilitated exchanges. And also because people are f circulating in and out of that insurance pool so often sometimes with fluctuating income and fluctuating employment. Um, we don't really have great data on what's happening in the exchanges, except on, you know, if you get lucky and one state decides to give you their information. Sorry, data in the exchanges means, what do you mean by that exactly? So when people go onto the, the marketplaces, mm -hmm. the healthcare marketplaces, healthcare.gov mm -hmm. is the, the entry point for all of the expansion states, or rather all of the states that elected to have the federal government mm -hmm. run the exchange for them and allow people to enroll that way. Then there are also a few states who do their own. But by data on the exchanges, I mean who's enrolling in the plans, what plans are they electing. You've heard a lot about bronze and silver and gold. Um, the counties that are bare, where people don't have an option of uh, any exchange. And then what happens to their utilization once they're enrolled. So after a person elects a plan, picks the bronze or the silver or gold, and they you know, use health care during that mm -hmm. year, what does their utilization look like? What does their spending look like? How many people shop? in the next year? That's a big unanswered question. How satisfied are they? Are those also those sorts of things? What are their health outcomes? Mm -hmm. What are the what are their out-of-pocket financial burdens? How much um, is this impacting family budget? 
Well, this has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you. I think I'm afraid we're out of time, but thank you so much for, for joining us today and I look forward to all the sorts of research that uh, you guys put out. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so. This is Snack Break. I'm Arup Mukherjee. And to view more episodes, please visit our website at snackbreakshow.com.